My name is Rich Boom, um, president of a company called Construction Support Services. We're an engineering. Are you trying to film me? So I, Absolutely. I should stay stay static. <laughs> oh, you're Is that what you're trying to do? I'll, I'll follow you around. You're good. Um, you move. We're an engineering company. Uh, to give you a little bit of my background, I started out in single ply roofing 30 years ago with a little company called Firestone. Some of you may have heard of them. Um, and then I came out to Colorado with the Roofing Industry Educational Institute taught for the Institute and was director of the Institute for nine years and then started construction support services. Teaching uh, was a little bit of what we did, but most of what I do now is structural. Uh, we still do an awful lot of specification work for commercial projects, uh, but I would say at this point, 60% of everything I do is structural for tile. We look at something on the order of 500 houses a year. Um, so, it doesn't matter who the contractor is, pretty good chance I'm going to be doing the structural. Um, and there's whole neighborhoods, in fact, where the HOA, they don't care what roofer that you use, but I'm the only engineer they recommend. So, I kind of like that. Um, there's some specific things that we need to talk about <coughs> for roofing and, and roofing work in snow country. A lot of the basic details work very well in Denver. If you go up the hill, things do get really strange. So we're going to focus mostly on the Denver market and, and the snow issues that we have here and then explain what some of the extremes become for some of the other areas. The, the big issues, number one, weight. Everybody loves to tell me stories about how heavy tile is. It's so heavy. It weighs all of 10 pounds. Well, the 3,000 pound gorilla is not the tile, it's the 30 pounds per square foot or 3,000 pounds per square of snow. Basically, using normal snow tables for Colorado, that's about five feet of snow sitting on the roof. So when you get five feet of snow, you're starting to push the snow limit. So it's not the weight of that little tile at the bottom. And that's the piece that kind of throws people off. Flashing heights. You know, when you have five feet of snow, the snow is coming up the side of the wall. If you don't have a way of dealing with that and dealing with the water that that holds against your wall, you're going to have a problem. And you'll see some very nice slides coming in. And a lot of a lot of the detailing is so simple. It's just a matter of simple things like peel and stick underlayment and you know, good roofing practice is really important here. So if we just follow the normal good roofing practice, we don't we don't have lots of problems. Tile is an extremely popular system. That's why you're all here, <clears throat> and it works just great. You don't have to put solid ice and water shield down on an entire roof in order to put tile on it. As long as you follow the guidelines, and I know Gary's covered some of those things in, in his talk, and, and you're going to hear about some more throughout the rest of the day, if you're just following the guidelines that are out there, they're published, you're going to be in good shape, screw up, and yeah, you're going to, it's an expensive fix. So. Some basics of underlayment, specifically ice damming. I hear stories from some of the early tile pioneers who say, oh, you don't have to worry about ice damming with tile roofs because you have ventilation. And we don't have to worry about it because the Denver market doesn't have ice damming issues. <laughs> well, um, both are wrong. I've measured water depths, liquid water over nine inches deep behind ice dams. So you have to have protection at your eaves if you want to keep that water out. And it doesn't matter what roofing system you have, it's going to occur. Tile, asphalt shingles, metal shingles, any of it. You've got to be prepared. Now, there are some simple things you can do, which you see actually here. If you notice, that's an athletic sock that's been packed with ice melter. And you 
basically take take a, a take a, a, a knee high type athletic sock. Uh, the other is one leg of a panty pair of pantyhose. You fill it with ice melter, tie it off. You can throw it up over the ice stand. It'll melt its way through, and that actually will, once the water's off the roof, it doesn't dissolve anymore, it'll sit there. Next big snow comes, it'll start, and it'll keep the, uh, it'll keep the ice from forming an ice dam, and you can get through most of the winter. You do get a little efflorescence or, or residue on the tile. You may need to warn your owners about that, but it's a good way to keep your ice dams from forming. Um, did you patent that? No. I did not patent it. <laughs> and, and I pass it along freely for use by anybody. Um, it works really, really well. Yeah. It's going to go on Shark Tank with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the stories that you hear about, oh, we've got all this ventilation underneath our tile, so the ice damming is not as big an issue. I, I will say that there's a lot of truth to that. <clears throat> if you can get a very well ventilated roof assembly, you will reduce the amount of ice damming. The problem is as the snow falls, it stops some of that ventilation. So therefore we go back to a static condition. So good ice and water shield underneath the tile will save you from some of these situations. The last one was uh, asphalt shingles. This one is a tile roof and you can see the uh, that, that ventilation underneath doesn't help them much. When you get into thicker snow fields, snowpack, you've got to make sure that you have good control of that water at any sidewall condition. And that's one of those things that people forget about. And, and I, I've done it too because most of the time sidewalls let enough heat out it'll melt the snow away from the wall. And you get up in the veil and you'll have a snowpack that's four or five feet deep and you'll have 12 inches of space between the wall and the snowpack. And that's because the heat has melted it back away from the wall. The problem is as it's doing that, that water is now inches above the level of your roofing system. So you have got to make sure that any place where you're going to have drifting, where you're going to have very deep snow packs, that you've got your flashings getting in behind those walls. Now, in most cases, you can go in, tuck in up behind the siding, and that'll work just fine. The siding will counter flash down into your sidewall flashing, and, and the water will run out. Works great until whoever built the building forgot to put the paper in the wall. Or as one contractor put it, he said, oh, it must have evaporated. <laughs> well, I, I can't make this stuff up. Yeah, it paper paper. Evaporated. evaporated, yeah, it was, it was there, but the heat you know, must, have, must have shrunk and it evaporated over time. Never seen black paper do that, but I guess this guy was really special. Um, so, We've got to make sure that you're tying into a good waterproofing system behind that wall. Does that mean you got to take some siding off? Yeah, sometimes you may have to take siding off. You're going to see some pictures in a minute of, of what I find when it comes to these sidewall issues. The snow melt is going to happen. It happens fast, especially in our spring times. Uh, this weekend, especially anything that's up the hill a little bit, they're going to have liquid water three and four inches up in that snowpack because it's going to be so wet. So if your flashings aren't properly set up for water shedding, and sometimes even if they are, you can get water that's going to track itself into that roofing system. So you've got to look carefully when you're putting in a, especially sidewalls that you're tucking up as far as you can get into that wall system and that when you're putting it into the wall system it's layered into the wall correctly. Um, do you have a marker uh, for the whiteboard? You know I have a little bridge, I'm not sure if there is or not. Uh, I, didn't bring, I know I didn't bring one but basically what got one there well, I can I can 
sketch it out real quick. I don't see one on the on the floor, okay. but uh, that's all right. Basically, what happens is this: if I have a, a a wall coming down, and I stick my metal in behind the siding, but I'm outside of the the waterproof layer that's in the wall. Water coming down inside the wall now is directed behind my flashings. Now, is that a roofing problem or a wall problem? No, it's a roofing problem because you'll never, fi never find a siding contractor. They're all gone. <laughs> Think about it. How many siding contractors hang around? True. Okay? <laughs> Roofers always, it's a roof leak. If the water drips, it's a roof leak. So you're gonna you're you're gonna have to investigate it if nothing else. So if it's nothing more than making sure you take off enough of the siding to get that flashing in up behind, can save you a lot of headaches later on down the line. I, I don't want to diminish my ventilation discussion. Um, the reason that this gets dark is because. The, uh, the plywood's no longer reflecting light. And it's not because I spray painted it black. Okay? Do, I, 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 I'm not a mold expert. <laughs> it didn't look like paint. Let's just say that, okay? Yes, we get good ventilation with, with tile roofs at the tile level. But the attics still have to be ventilated. And, and I see a lot of cases where people throw down a tile roof and somebody forgets that all those box vents they took out need to be either replaced by a new type of vent or a ridge vent. There's a lot of options that you have but you have to make sure we have the ventilation. And when you put it in, I don't know how if you can you can see that. Can we can we turn that light down just for a minute? Is there a can this here here is the edge of this uh, that helps. Here's the edge of that vent. You know, somebody went to a lot of trouble to cut a hole and they missed the darn thing. That doesn't qualify because I've got a quarter of the venting that I should have. You have to, you have to do good ventilation. Colorado, we're we can you can get away with it a little bit. I had a call yesterday <laughs> afternoon. Yeah, there we go. That that shows it up. <clears throat> I had a call yesterday afternoon on a ventilation issue. <clears throat> I had a call this morning at 7.30 on a ventilation issue. And a guy had checked 22 roofs, 18 of them were showing mold because the ridge vent system wasn't working. Okay, so make sure that you have the ventilation in place and, and there's some very good vent systems that work very well with tile, but you have to install them. We want half our ventilation low, half of our ventilation high. If, if you can't do that, the other thing you can look at doing is you start looking at going to power ventilation with humidistats, and all of a sudden some of this starts to sound expensive, and it can be. And there are some homeowners that don't want to spend the money to do it. Well, what do you think it's going to cost them to fix that? Oh yeah, by the way, the roof's got to come off again to fix that. The roof comes off, you have to pull all that out of there, and it gets pricey, doesn't it? All right, let's talk about the, 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 the thing that most people are interested in as far as an, as an engineer. What are some of the weight issues that we ought to be concerned about? Number one, anything that's over 50 years old. <clears throat> there were a lot of smaller homes built in the 60s, and most of the smaller homes are fine because the spans are short. As you start getting into the later 60s, the houses started getting bigger. And that's actually when we started seeing some problems 
before we flipped over and went to trusses. As we get older than 50, as we start getting into the 80, 90 year old houses, we start seeing lighter and lighter framing. I've seen houses that have 20 foot long rafters that are just two by fours. And single span. Some of them, I had one that had three inches of deflection. Technically, it's collapsed. That's, that is technically, as an engineer, I have to say this house is in a state of collapse. Why haven't these houses come down? Because they had no insulation. The snow never piled up on the roof. The heat escaped through the attic, melted the snow off. The wood was also much better wood than we use today, but solid sawn lumber, and it was full dimension, which you don't see at all. But the people are coming in, they're going to put a new roof on. What's one of the things they do? They insulate. All of a sudden, the house that's gone 100 years with no problems of snow load collapses because they insulated it. And so now the heat isn't escaping to melt the snow off the top. When you're going in and you're going to talk to someone about putting tile onto a house, and some of these old houses even had tile on them. Part of it was some of them had clay tile. So they were a lighter tile in a lot of cases. And then they had no insulation. And if it sagged a little bit, nobody cared. Well, now they're insulating. They want to put on a concrete tile, which is a, a much, which is a heavier product. And now all of a sudden they do need to have things done to the house. So the mid seventies construction I mentioned, you walk into a house where everything is a cathedral ceiling, be a little concerned. Not necessarily a problem, but they're much harder to inspect. And there are, I have hit a couple of houses that were architecturally significant. And those architecturally significant houses were not well engineered houses. Um, if you have cracks in the ceiling, and typically when I say this, I'm talking about cracks in the middle of the ceiling. Cracks along the wall, ceiling wall junctures, it's house movement. We live in Colorado, houses move. If you have a crack in the middle, something is causing the middle of the ceiling to move. And normally that's a roof weight. So we may have some deflection issues. Um, if you ever see an attic that is painted white, that is a red flag. It has had a problem. And we're gonna, we'll talk some more specifically now. So this is, uh, this is two by fours, full span from the, the eave to the ridge, spaced sheathing. You can see the underside of the old cedar shingles. Probably got a couple, three layers of asphalt. Somebody's come along and, and nailed some one by fours in place. We are probably going to need to do some stiffening in this house. Now, there's a few things that happen. If it's a small house, and many of the old houses are really small, very steep roofs, it's not too difficult to stiffen them. As we get to larger, older houses, where, and they've brought the slope down in the 612 range, then typically we are going to have to do something to get some stiffness into that roof assembly. And our choices are generally we can sister them, or we can install some horizontal uh, framing that we bring into a bearing wall that's in the house. You're not going to do any of that part of it. That's my job. But when you get into these old houses, there's still a lot that need to be re-roofed in, in uh, old Denver. You're going to have to look at, at some of these as, a, as the potential fix. As we go from 612 to 1212, very commonly, we have to put solid sheathing on these things anyway. If I take a house that has spaced sheathing like this, strip it back to the spaced sheathing, I put a 716 or heavier sheathing over it, 
if I screw that to the rafters, I actually can make those two by fours almost as stiff as a two by six. You can structurally attach your sheathing so that we actually can increase the stiffness and we create a, a much better diaphragm in that roof. And in a lot of cases, that's all we've got to do. Well, heck, you're already putting the new, the new sheathing on this thing. It's just how you attach it, and I can make this thing stiffer. So for a very small marginal cost, the roof can take the weight. So that's one of the options. You also have to be very careful about old damage. Um, a lot of times you get into these houses and stuff's been busted for a while. Uh, somebody moved a wall and they never bothered to check things structurally and now there's other damage and, and that's something which I look for. The other problem that we have with old houses in Denver, and last April or early May, there was one that collapsed, made the evening news. And my rule of thumb is I don't ever want one of my projects to make the evening news. <laughs> <clears throat> I looked at six collapses last year. Not a single one of the ones I looked at made the news because we were able to get to them. I actually had a call one time, the contractor said, Rich, how soon can you get to such and such address? And I said, how's next Monday? And he said, it's collapsing right now. And I was there in 10 minutes. We were able to st stop it and stabilize it. The problem is, a lot of these old houses in Denver, a normal house today has a nice triangular structural system. The rafters are tied to the ceiling joists. These old houses in Denver, the ceiling joists are perpendicular to the roof rafters. So there's nothing resisting this thing moving out. And I call it out thrust. As you load the roof, it pushes out. In a lot of cases, people say, well, these have been sitting here. It's got four roofs on it. We're taking that weight off. Yeah, well, sometimes that weight's the friction that holds it together. You get up there and start pounding on this roof, you're vibrating it. You start dropping bundles of shingles, and of course, tile, onto these roofs, those loads, boom, will push the center down, push the walls out. So, as you get into, especially the 1890s through about 1930 construction, You've got to be very, very careful about how you tear off, how you load, and making sure that things are tied together. You don't have to do the calculations or any of that stuff. Engineers do that, but it's something that you may want to make sure whoever you call is an engineer. If you're not using me, that's fine, but make sure that they're familiar with this problem so that it's a simple thing. You tear off around the edge, you just attach the rafters, tie them back into the joists with some steel straps. We're fine. If you don't do it, then you'll call me for the collapse. That's a lot more expensive. Mid-70s, as the, as the construction industry switched over to trusses, trusses didn't have standard techniques for connections. And so we get what I call the bottle cap truss plate. And these don't meet today's standards. They still may be fine, but it's something that as an engineer you have to watch out for. <clears throat> the other problem was that there was a lot of, you know, trusses were standard. So if somebody wanted something a little different in their house, they'd have a few standard trusses and then they'd switch to some stick framing. But with the explosive growth, especially in Colorado, they were grabbing framers from anywhere they could grab a body. Some of you may be familiar with that problem right now. Some of these guys didn't have a clue what they were doing. They would slap in a two by four when they should have been using a two by eight. But you know, you're up there and you're doing your stuff and the two by eights are on the pile down there. I have a two by four, I'm gonna grab the two by four and stick it in, nobody will notice. And 
at one point there were what two inspectors for all of uh, Arapahoe County uh, there were four inspectors for all of Jeffco <coughs> needless to say some of these things got missed on framing inspections well now we come back in these are the kinds of things that as an engineer I'm looking at to say okay 19 late 70s construction yeah I'm probably gonna see some so I, I call it jack framing between truss runs probably the number one thing that I see houses that are all cathedral you know when I when I get in an attic and I see TJI's sticking up from where the cathedral ceiling ends I'm not worried we can do about anything we want in most of those by the time the engineers and designers were putting TJI's into uh, cathedral ceilings, they had it figured out. Where I have a problem are some of these houses where you get in there and what you see are two by sixes, 12 inches on center or tighter. Because they just, I've got one, contra one contractor, I've looked at probably 400 houses that this guy built. And as he was making the transition into trusses, he just, he, he, when he had a cathedral ceiling, he just throw in extra two by sixes. So it's only a six inch thick slab, but you know, he has these long spans. Well, you can't do that. The good news for him is you can't much put much R value in a six inch ceiling slab. So therefore he, the snow melts off anyway. But as, Denver and some of the other municipalities are now saying, hey, you've got to come in and put insulation on top of this to meet the new energy codes, then it's going to become a factor. If you walk through a house and you see ceiling cracks in the middle of ceilings, um, yeah, we probably, as an, as, you know, from an engineering standpoint, are going to have some issues. Um, that's an indication that something's a little too soft. As I said, the, the ones at this, the wall ceiling juncture, that's normal, customary. Um, if I don't see them, I know you've already fixed them. And anything that's, if you walk in and you look in an attic and everything's sprayed white, be scared. Um, probably fire. Could be mold. Those are the, the two main reasons that everything gets sprayed white. And so it's, it's, it's a huge flag. When structural wood loses 10% of its mass to rot, it loses 90% of its strength. Really? Yeah. So can you say that, can you say yeah. that again? When structural wood loses 10% of its mass to rot, it loses 90% of its strength. That's scary. When you see things spray white, either fire or mold. Fire, char isn't that big a deal. You scrape back the char. The wood that's underneath, just as strong as it was. There is no loss of strength for the, the wood that remains after the outside's been charred. So when I've gone into fire situations, you can scrape back the char, measure what's left. Yeah, you're still good. Now, there are times we sister it. There are times we take it out for other reasons. Smell, for one. It's easier to replace it than it is to clean it. But from a structural standpoint, and especially in an old one, you know, I don't mind a little char here and there. It's not gonna hurt anything. Long as the, the members are still in pretty decent shape. So, what do you do when you do hit problems? Um, and what I did here, this is some uh, structural model that we made. And this is showing that we have in this member a, a large deflection. And when I look at this is the bending moment, you don't need to know all this, but basically if this number is over 100, we have a problem. This number can be over 100, and that still could be okay. This is the one that becomes really critical. This says we're at 182% of safe loading. Needless to say, that's not safe. Um, 
I always try to flag them. In this case, this is a this is one that had a big structural crack in it for some reason. Most of the time, the repair is as simple as sistering it, putting another section of wood adjacent to it, attaching it with glue and screws and or nails. Again, here's one that was broken. See the break? What's sad to me is, in a lot of cases, when I get into an attic, I find wood that's broken. I can tell that it was broken when they built the house. Some cases you can see that they had wrapped a cable sling around the truss and broke it. Um, in other cases, you can see where the carpenter, the framer, tried to tack some scab piece of wood on there. It's like, come on, guys, you're, you're framers. You, sh you know how to do this stuff. Do it right. And they don't tend to do that. So problems. Uh, basically, when we hit problems, there needs to be a way that we communicate to you as a contractor what the problem is. Um, and if you walk into a house, you see some of the things that I've just shown you, the one thing I will tell you is do not make a structural statement. Don't say, you definitely have a problem here. Until you're licensed, as an engineer, you can't make those statements. And the problem may be really, really minor. And it may not be something that's going to affect the installation of the roof. So just because you've seen some of these things, I love it when a contractor calls me up and says, hey, when I was in this, I saw some cracks. I, I'm not sure what's going on. That's great. That gives me a little bit of a heads up to something I need to be looking at. But don't tell a homeowner, oh, God, your house is falling down. <laughs> or your house might fall down. Because you could be completely wrong. In fact, most of the time when homeowners tell me, yeah, well, my contractor told me that uh, there's, there's only one contractor that I have run into that routinely says tile will crush your house. And that's because he, that, that contractor installs stone-coated steel. <laughs> but I will say that when they have to install concrete tile because stone-coated steel is not allowed, I do all their engineering. So, so <laughs> that's one of the ways I know they do that because I've had several homeowners tell me, yeah, yeah, they told me they couldn't do tile until I told them I couldn't do stone-coated steel. And then they immediately said, oh, well, yeah, that's no problem. <laughs> um, but don't, you know, if you see something, any of the things I've just shown you, worth it to make sure you pass that information along. It's good before I, as an engineer, walk in that I know some of this stuff. But don't, don't scare the homeowners. Their house has stood, you know, some of these houses have been up for 120 years already. They've been through some hellacious snowfalls, and they're still up. Changing the roof weight, you know, you take off four layers of asphalt shingles and a layer of cedar shakes, you've taken off over 10 pounds per square foot. Now, from an engineering standpoint, the house may have been overloaded. It may have actually been in a state of structural collapse. So we're going to make sure that nothing happens for the next hundred years. But just be very careful with what you say. When you're looking at these houses, if for some reason you have reason to suspect a problem, don't walk around on the roof. <laughs> I'm sorry, I got to say it. <laughs> Can, can you see the sag in this roof? Do you see the, see the sag? This is one I was actually walking on four stories up. And within about four steps on the roof, I started stepping only on the rafters. Now, how could I tell I was on the rafters? It's because those were the high points. This roof was dished between the rafters. It's an apartment building in the springs. They vented all the bathroom vents into the attic. <laughs> oh my God. 
the entire tops of these buildings had to be taken off and redone. But if you start to walk a deck and you start feeling soft spots, stay on the rafters. And, and it's amazing how fast you'll know where they are and how quickly you can adjust your stride so it's exactly 24 <laughs> inches. Or you take short steps if, for the few that are 16 on center. <coughs> If you can't get in under, and if you can't get in underneath <coughs> to see the deck, you'll feel it. You mean it's as I call it, my educated big toe. You you learn really quickly what what works and doesn't work. Um, let me hit a couple of pet peeves, and and I added some of this um, actually the last time we did this discussion because. It, he wasn't going to get up and stop me. <laughs> I, I usually don't get called after the roof is installed for the good ones. How's that? Um, have you already been through the layout and, uh, and, yes. and the, the tapes? Yes, we just did that before. And I, I didn't put that one in this year. I, I thought about putting that in this morning and I didn't add it. I, I look at a lot of million dollar homes. And it is so sad to me when I go out and I look at a million dollar home and as I walk up the front, the front steps or the front walk, there is no attempt at having a uniform coursing for the dormer that sticks out or for the side by the garage, whatever. So you've got this beautifully laid up tile roof and, and you look over and all the coursing is completely off and it doesn't even match on the different sides. And I know, you know, you wanted to not have those funky top ridge tile and so forth, but I will tell you, if I have a uniform gutter line and I'm off by half a tile, halfway up, it looks like crap. And I have had some owners who have made contractors take them off and put them back on and create a uniform line, horizontal line. And in the back, that's not as big a deal, but boy, in your front, watch your exposures and, and oh, you know, maybe you've got to trim some tile at the top and drill them. And I know that slows you down, but boy, it looks a whole lot better. All right, we'll start with that, which I didn't put in this year. We'll put it in maybe next year. I did add a couple of other pictures, though. Crap under the tile. I was out looking at, uh, well, I look at a lot of tile roofs after the fact. When I lift up, especially near a valley, and it is full of all the debris and the trims and so forth, it's like, come on, guys, throw it off the roof. And, and if it was just the corners that you cut off, or some excess mortar because you were mortaring in a ridge. Yeah, I can almost understand that. It's the beer cans. <laughs> Don't laugh. Piles of screws and nails. Piles of screws and nails. Wrappers for food. Food debris. Most of the time I'm out there, it's just the bones left, but Chicken you know. <laughs> you know. This is not your personal disposal area. I get up on, on roofs, and I had one that was a turret. It's like there, were these, there was a wad of sealant that was fully an inch thick and covered the, the top four inches of the tile. Well, yes, there had been a leak. The owners finally called me in to find that leak. But all the contractor had done was just put wads of sealant on top of wads of sealant without ever looking for the cause of the leak. <laughs> Guess what? The first wad of sealant wasn't stuck to the tile. So all the subsequent wads of sealant did absolutely nothing but just get ugly. You shouldn't need a whole lot of sealant on a good properly applied tile roof. I have looked at tile roofs in Thailand. I have looked at tile roofs in China. I have looked at tile roofs at the Vatican. They don't have wads of sealant on them. 
Now the Vatican, that's because of holy intervention. But, <laughs> but there's, there's no reason for wads of sealant. Use it sparingly when you need to. But make sure you know why you're doing it before you put it on. And then when you put it on, make sure the surfaces are properly clean, dry, so that you get a good bond to do what you want it to do. I have lifted up sections of tile and found pieces of underlayment, and probably was Gary cutting sections out. <laughs> if you're laying down underlayment, and you've got the stucco guy coming out and he's going to do his thing before you put the tile on. And, and I see this a lot. And he messes up your underlayment. Don't just patch it. Make the sucker pay for new underlayment. Push it. And especially in a high-end home, you can sometimes just say, I'm going to throw down a, an underlayment that I have no intention of using just so the stucco guy can get up there and screw it up because that seems to be his major job. And then once he's out of my way, we'll come in, put down proper underlayment, properly attached, that's going to perform correctly. If you have, during the process, the underlayment gets damaged, you got caught in the hailstorm with the roof open, um, you know, some other reason the stuff gets damaged, guess what? You're better off to take up some of those battens and put it back down in full sheets, big pieces, than you are to try and piece in something because I will guarantee you it won't work. It will be a pain to find the leaks. And, and when you do, you end up talking to guys like me with a lawyer standing there saying, would you raise your right hand first? And you don't want to do that. The one that I added this morning, the couple slides here. <coughs> this is a, a, a project here in, here in uh, Denver near the tech center. That tile is butted right up against a fake stucco fiberboard product. And I haven't, I haven't pulled to see who's in the audience to know whether the contractor who did it is here or not. Uh -oh. um, but we can check. <laughs> I'm not going to say who it was. I see this all the time. And what's even wilder is, in a lot of the cases, there's a, there's a board that comes down here. They actually notch the tile so the water would run right into the board. <laughs> Okay, show that, show me in the manual, show me that detail. I know what, I know what the book says, all right? Personally, I don't think you should ever have siding that comes down below the top edge of the top. I know TRI lets you do that as long as you have an air gap because my feeling is that gets packed with snow and ice and you still get water into this stupid fiberboard and it all falls apart. So. I always say, I want to see that cut back. I want a minimum of one inch. Minimum of one inch. I think you the manual shows two. I'll take an inch, as long as it's a minimum of an inch. Now, some homeowners will say, I don't want to see, I want hey, my tile, I don't want to see the metal. Well, guess what? Get colored metal. Kynar coated metal that's dark, don't use bright metal. Oh, but that will cost us an extra 30 cents on the job. <laughs> you guys are laughing. I had one I told I, HOA, we held $80,000 because and this, that was one of the mistakes. They have, these are, these are million and a half dollar townhomes. And this sucker used galvanized metal on his exposed metal on million dollar, million and a half dollar townhomes. And it's like, no, Kynar coated. Okay, case like this, 
you trim the siding back. Oh, that's a pain in the butt. Come on. Have you, you know, there's all kinds of tools out there that will let you trim that back. Now, if it's stucco and you have a receiver that's at a certain level, okay, I will agree it is a pain in the ass to trim back stucco. And then if you do, trying to match the stucco is, is bad. That's a case, and probably the only case, where it makes sense to go ahead and just hold the tile away from the wall. Here's where I lifted the tile and looked in underneath at the pan flashing. Here's one of those boards I told you about, okay? That they had notched the tile around so the water would hit the thing. Oh, guess what? The pan doesn't actually go under the siding. They just stuck it up against it. I guess they figured if they got the tile tight enough to the siding, they could run a bead of caulk along there and that would work. You know, I, I'm not smart enough to make up stuff like this. Um, and, and I feel sorry for the homeowner who called me out because she was very unhappy. She knew something was wrong. What's even more frustrating to me is this is a good contractor. I mean, this is, this is a contractor that normally doesn't screw up much. But because the owner of the firm didn't like this lady because she was a bit of a pain in the ass. And, and all of us have dealt with those people. He wouldn't even do it after I showed him how the crew had screwed this thing up. It's like, you know what, guys? If you do it wrong, you're human. Come on out and fix it because it's going to cost you a whole lot less than if we have to get attorneys involved or... I mean, the cost to just call your attorney is going to cost you more than this probably would have cost effects. Um, I can't tell you whether this has gone, it hasn't gone to attorneys as far as I know, but uh, part of that was because the salesman involved did get involved and I think he was able to get, it was a four foot section. You know, we're not talking about re-roofing the whole house. It was about a four foot section. So the salesman made And he may have out of his pocket because he also did, he also wanted the next four houses down the street. But this is the kind of stuff that it's not hard. And, and some of this does come down to selling it. When you're talking to the homeowner, say, this is how we do it. We follow the manual. There are guys out there who will charge you a little bit less for a tile roof, but they're not gonna follow these details. And we're going to use better materials. We're going to use better detailing because we don't ever want to have to visit your house again other than socially. Do it once, do it right, never do it again. And with tile roofs, I dare say, done properly, they're going to outlast all of us in this room. Although a couple of young guys here, maybe, maybe we'll still be in the business 40 years from now. But there's, there's no excuse, especially when you've got reasonably good details. And, and I have talked to a couple of contractors who say, well, I keep complaining to Rick that we've got to change this detail and that detail. And I say, well, fine, that's, you know, you can do that. But the details do work if you do them correctly. So that's all I had. That gave you my two cents worth of